And good evening, everyone. Dr. Bill Tulo, Medical Director at Oculus, and welcome to the Oculus Clinical Webinar Series. Tonight, I am really excited to welcome two of the most prolific contact lens fitters in the world, Dr. Ken Maller and Dr. Chris Sint. Uh, before I do introductions, formal introductions, just some housekeeping. If you have questions tonight, please put them into the chat so that we can compile them and we'll leave some time at the end of the webinar to answer your questions. If we have too many questions and we run long, we will certainly answer them remotely via email. Again, tonight is really an exciting uh, talk. Uh, it's called Data-Driven Designs to Avoid Problems to Ultimately Create a Better Lens. Chris, I'll introduce you first. Dr. Chris Sint graduated the Ohio State University College of Optometry in 1994. She completed her residency at the Cleveland VA Medical Center in 1995. Dr. Sint joined the faculty of the University of Iowa Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences, where she's currently professor of clinical ophthalmology and director of contact lens service. She also serves as a consultant optometrist for the Ohio City Department of Veterans Affairs Medical Center. Dr. Sint is chief clinical editor for review of optometry and serves as a peer reviewer for several journals of ophthalmology. Dr. Sint holds seven US patents and over 150 publications. She's the inventor and founder of iPrint Prosthetics and obtained FDA approval for her process and design and her designs are now in global markets. Dr. Ken Maller earned his doctorate from the Illinois College of Optometry and is currently in solo private practice in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. His practice is devoted to orthokeratology, myopia management, as well as providing visual rehabilitation to the irregular cornea. He's one of the foremost wave contact lens designers in the world and authored the first wave contact lens designer certification program. Dr. Maller lectures extensively on custom contact lens design as well as providing clinical consultation services. Dr. Maller also is one of the first doctors to start using the Penicam corneal scleral profiler scan or CSP software, including when he was still in beta over five years ago. He's a fellow in the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomate of the cornea contact lens and refractive technology section of the American Academy of Optometry and a fellow in the International Academy of Orthokeratology and a diplomate in the American Board of Optometry and a fellow of the Scleral Lens Society. Wow, and I'm sure we, we shortened that down. Um, <laughs> it's amazing the credentials of these two speakers tonight. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our speakers tonight. Guys, take it away. Well, thanks a lot, Bill. Thank you. And w welcome to uh, Chris. And uh, I'm very happy to be here as well and uh, uh, sharing the stage uh, to uh, present this uh, wonderful uh, material that we're going to uh, be doing tonight. So we're going to be talking about data-driven designs uh, to um, really create much better lenses and uh, to get to those results more um, uh, expeditiously, uh, as well as ultimately provide a much uh, finer uh, outcome uh, at the end. Uh, you could see there, uh, we've created a little crystal ball there with the diagnostic contact lens fitting and the tombstone, uh, because I really do believe that that is not the future. The future really is getting all of this data so that we can really design some phenomenal uh, plastic that can really do a job much, much better uh, than we can do through the uh, diagnostic fitting process. And let's go ahead and start advancing some slides. Uh, this is a little bit of who we are, uh, although uh, Dr. Chulu has certainly gone through uh, all, of, uh, all of our credentials and the like there. So we're just going to kind of move along here. All right. So the reason we really want to design these is so you can really give your thought process to the patient and think about the case and, and let the um, uh, data drive the design so that we can get the eye successful. And mm -hmm. I just prepared this uh, brief uh, slide here, uh, sort of comparing diagnostic fitting to uh, data-driven uh, fitting. And you can see here on the benefit side, diagnostic fitting really has uh, only one uh, benefit. Uh, and the benefit is that you don't actually need a scleral profilometer to uh, do the uh, uh, process. You can do this all 
by grabbing a uh, trial lens set, assessing things at the biomicroscope, uh, and then making appropriate changes to whatever design you happen to be working with. Uh, if you do have a profilometer, it actually does help that process, but it is not mandatory. And so that's a limited investment that you would have to make to uh, start uh, doing these types of lenses. However, on the disadvantage side, you see there's a lot of disadvantages to diagnostic fitting. It's more chair time. The patient experience is not very pleasant. Uh, the uh, inventory of lenses have to be maintained and you have to be able to disinfect them properly as well as refile them. And so they're uh, good to go the next, uh, for the next patient that you're going to be taking care of. The parameters themselves are somewhat limited by whatever the designs um, uh, are being offered by that particular laboratory within that particular uh, framework of, uh, of design. Um, and making very specific focal changes is either very difficult or actually impossible to do. Whereas if you're doing the empirical fitting uh, you know, from the data, you don't need any lens inventory. It is very quick and efficient to get to success. Uh, you really can get very unique design features into the lenses to solve very specific requirements of these eyes and again change these very very unique spots that may be problematic and you absolutely will improve your success rates. Uh, the only disadvantage is that you do need to get the equipment so that you can uh, collect the data um, and when you're both learning how to utilize that particular equipment as well as designing from the software side that does require a little bit of investment in time so that you can learn what to do because now it's really all up to you uh, because it's not coming from a, a fitting guide that has been run through uh, R&D and uh, put out into clinical service to give you an idea where to go. I'm going to let uh, Chris take care of this one. Great. So when I started fitting scleral lenses in the late 1990s, um, it really fit into the category of we didn't know what we didn't know. And we just started putting lenses on eyes and oh, if they stayed on, that was great. And if they made the eye red, eh, whatever are better options, right? But with data-driven designs, we really start to know. We start to, beyond just uh, K ratings and diameter, you get these these elevation differences. You know what the depth of the, the cornea really is and, and how the eye changes. And that allows you to really start thinking, how am I going to fit this lens and how am I going to solve these problems? Because eyes really aren't just round or not round, right? They're incredibly complicated. And so we know more than we did before. Go ahead. So here we have um, uh, three types of profilometry that are available. Uh, over here that we're discussing. On the uh, far left there, you see the uh, eaglet uh, ESP, that's the eye surface profiler, uh, giving you a colorful map and a cross-sectional view of the uh, elevations there. In the middle there, you see the uh, Penicam uh, uh, chloral, uh, corneal scleral profiling uh, system, uh, and that's all of the arcs of all the various um, uh, cross-sections that have been uh, captured. And then on the right-hand side is the eye, uh, eye impression data that's done through uh, iPrim Pro, uh, or it's affectionately known as the blue goo, uh, so that we can get a real good impression of what's exactly on that eye. So how the workflow um, proceeds when you're doing these, you'll see I, I labeled there step number one on the left-hand side, and basically you collect data from something whether it, in this case it's the eye surface profiler or the pentacam that's in the middle or the, uh, the impression data. And then you get to step number two, and this is very important. Uh, you have to assess how good is the quality of that data that you've gone ahead and collected. Uh, if the data is no good, trust me, you will not get a lens that's going to work. It, just, it doesn't work that way. You do have to really understand the equipment. You have to be able to get good impression or you have to get a good capture. Uh, with the uh, profilers so that you do have good quality data. That's then fed into software. On the uh, top half of the screen over number three there, that's the uh, Wave software platform, uh, which I've been utilizing now for just about a quarter of a century. Uh, and uh, down below is the um, uh, iPrim Pro software uh, so that you can manipulate that data and, cr and create those lenses. Number four is really the sum total of what did we just achieve and you are going to get a very unique lens that's manufactured and then evaluated on that particular patient. 
often, if you've done a really good job at collecting the data, the first lens is going to fit anything between excellent to perfect. Because if you have the data, you will design a lens that fits properly. Usually it only requires very minor adjustments and most often it's primarily just an optical adjustment that you have to uh, take into account because especially if you're dealing with irregular eyes, it's very uh, difficult to get good optical data to know what needs to be into the lens. Mm -hmm. uh, as you get you better, know, oh, go ahead, Chris. You know, one of the things that changed my uh, thinking, Ken, when I went to data-driven designs is rather than thinking like, oh, how do I change that curve? Do I need to steepen the curve or flatten the curve? I started really thinking about the eyeball. And when I put a lens on the 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 lens that you dispensed onto the eye, I think, do I need it closer to the patient or cl farther away from the patient? So you start thinking this way on the eye as opposed to curvatures. And I, I find it's a much easier concept, you know, oh, I need that spot to be off the eye a little bit, or I need that area to be closer to the eye. And you can change those in the software like you're showing so much easier than trying to decide, well, if I change this curve here, is that gonna shift the whole lens in a different direction? You're absolutely right because, uh, you know, I have a drawer full of diagnostic sets that have a three inch layer of dust on them because they've been sitting there for the last <laughs> 20 years or so because I, like you, have been using these data driven designs for that long. And it's a very, very strange concept uh, for me when people will come up to me and say, well, did you steepen the base curve? Or did you steepen like, this curve? I, I don't, I don't <laughs> think I think in terms of how much clearance is there between the plastic and the surface of the eye. That's how I think. I think in right. those, exactly as you're saying, does it need to be closer? Does it need to be further away? And you really mm -hmm. do move away from that whole idea of curvature at that point. Yeah. So you, you're 100% right. Yeah. And, you know, part of the workflow that people really need to think about in their in their clinic is when you're using a diagnostic fitting set, you have to let that lens settle onto the eye. You, you can't assess a diagnostic fitting lens in the first, say, 30 minutes. You need to put it on, let it settle down, and then decide how that fits and how you're gonna change the curve from there. That is a huge chunk of chair time, and that is very expensive. You think, oh, this lens, you know, this diagnostic lens is, seems less expensive. You start adding up those 30 minute chunks of your time, it's very expensive. The other thing is you put a diagnostic lens on the eye, if it doesn't fit right, you've now irritated the eye and you have to abandon the fit for that day. If you, if you're, it's like trying on shoes when your foot is swollen at that point, you can't keep going with that fit, right? Because you're gonna pay for it. You're gonna have another visit and another visit and another visit and another visit. Well, let's Chair time's forget. really expensive. Well, <laughs> let's, let's not forget, we not only irritated the eye, we irritated the patient as well. And, and that-, that, that <laughs> And your tax costs, and the doctor. <laughs> right, that costs too. Uh, when the patient is getting <laughs> irritated, uh, that's really problematic as well. So it really is. So it's a wonderful thing to be able to get that very first lens on and have it so close to perfect. It really makes the entire experience for the doctor and the patient much, much more pleasant. So and right. you're absolutely right about that. Okay. So why don't you talk about this picture? Sure. So data-driven data designs give you control points over the entire lens. So not only can you just say, uh, you don't change the base curve, right? You change the clearances. Well, how much space do I want underneath that central part of the lens? Okay. In the center, in the mid-periphery, you can raise or lower that point. That mid-peripheral control there, independent of, that of the center of the lens, that mid-peripheral control is where... When you get fogging, you're getting fogging because you are over vaulted. So in this example here, we see the eye. We see where that lens is sitting on the eye. You have to be able to manipulate that lens so that you don't have that over vaulting area because that's where you're going to start pulling stuff in underneath the lens. That's in an area where you have suction. You're going to get that midday fogging. So you want to be able to control that area separate from the rest of the, the lens. Go ahead and click again. So by doing this in 3D space, you already know where your problems are. You know, we read, we hear a lot in, in these Facebook groups and, you know, online or, or when we read articles about that limbus. 
And people will say, protect the limbus, don't crush the limbus, right? Well, you will almost never, you will never crush the limbus in a data-driven design because these data-driven designs know where the limbus is, right? So you create that lens so that you're not going to squish the limbus. But here's the thing, overvolting the limbus is really just as bad as undervolting and squishing the limbus, right? You don't want to rub those stem cells, but you don't want to create so much vault over it that you literally suck it up to the back, suck your limbus back to the back of the lens, because that's going to cause uh, that smile that you sometimes see when you put on a lens and in that bottom, you get that red ring. That's over vaulting the limbus in, the, in those cases. You really do want to avoid that because that is very irritating to the patient. So you want that alignment. You don't want it to dig in. You don't want it to over vault. You want that alignment to there. It's okay if it looks like it's touching. You don't want it squishing. Correct. Go ahead to the next area. Right. And then you want to be able, you can move these designs around, right? So that it's centered, so you can get your optics centered over the eye um, in, instead of just having it um, decentered down and inducing coma and other aberrations to the system. Right? So when you have decentered optics, your patient can say, my vision's worse with this lens on than with without it on. Right? You want to make sure you can move those optics and get this optic centered. Okay? That's now, yeah, we brought it up and we said, uh, about the limbus, right? You don't want to squish the limbus. Well, a lot of these lenses out there, diagnostic fitting, you you actually have a round lens that you're trying to put on to, onto the eye. But when you actually know where the limbus is, you design the lens around those limbal points. And the limbus is not round. The limbus is also not what we always, diameter-wise, what we always historically have said, right? We always said it's like somewhere between 11 and a half and 12 millimeters. But that's the visual limbus. The geometric limbus, where you're actually having that shape change, is a, is bigger than the than the visual limbus. And when you're fitting a lens, that's a geometry issue, and you need to fit the geometric limbus. The, the visual limbus is is usually about half a millimeter smaller. Yeah, and the limbus is actually not only is it not round, it's not planar. Right? The limbus is actually like a hyperbolic paraboloid. It's like a Pringle potato chip. So at three and nine o'clock, it's going to be higher. Higher up at, at um, 6 and 12 o'clock, it's going to be lower. So it's going to go up and down and around like a Pringle, like the rim of a Pringle potato chip. Absolutely. With, with um, these data-driven designs, you can also say, gosh, you know what? I got that pinguicula. A pinguicula, which often I can guarantee you didn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> How many times does that happen, Ken, where you get a lens on an eye and then, you know, when you did diagnostic fitting and then you thought, oh, that's pinching in that area and that's going to be a problem, right? I, I didn't really notice pinguiculas till I started making them really mad. And I've made pinguiculas mad before. <laughs> but with data drawing designs, you know where they are and you can create these little focal points, right? You're not guessing. You're not saying like, oh, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe that's 500 microns, 200 microns, 100 microns. I mean, do you even know how big a micron is, right? But with data-driven designs, you know exactly where it is. You can create that extra clearance over it, or it automatically happens for you. You don't even have to think about it. It just happens for you. Right, right. You, you, you know the elevations of these things because it was captured right there at the beginning in the mm -hmm. uh, capture system, whether it was through the, like I said, the eaglet or the pentacam or even in the impression. Yeah, and you're, so the software says, I see a, I see a bump there, and I'm just going to align with that bump and create That's that bump. That's correct. So to use parvulometry data, this is kind of what you were getting at before, right? You, you um, minimize the chair time by, by either selecting the first lens uh, out of your diagnostic set, right? So say, say you don't want to use software, right? At least the data-driven design can say, choose this one first. Right to put on, or it can go as what we are talking about, and I think Ken, what you and I prefer to do is do these empirically driven designs, right, yeah. and, and have it be, yeah, first first fit. And you know, most of the time, you can actually dispense even on the most complicated of eyes, you can dispense that first lens at least, even if you have to make a little power change. You're absolutely right. That 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 first lens dispense really does go up rather high when you start designing mm -hmm. this way using the software. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, chair time is expensive. All right, so this is here. Yeah, this particular patient, he presented to the practice wearing his habitual lens, and his complaint was his eye always hurts. He's red. Um, you know, people think that he has been drinking or um, 
that he's unwell or unhealthy. And he presents with this real, you can really see this pink wicula here with, with some impingement right at, right at the limbus. And, you know, if you were to look at this, you'd think maybe that lens is a little too small for that cornea, that that, that might be a little bit on the small side for that particular design uh, because there is so much impingement there. So we ended up, go ahead and click again, we ended up taking him out of this lens and we washed him out. Do not fit an eye that is that red or impinged because that is a lot of inflammation and you do want to calm that eye down before you gather your empiric data. Otherwise, it's it's like, again, trying on shoes when your foot is swollen. It's, it, you're not going to get quite the right data. So you do want to calm that eye down. So we washed him out. We added a steroid to calm him down pretty quickly and then we brought him back I, would, I usually suggest that people stay out at least 48 hours. Now, the more hot, the hotter the eye is, perhaps the longer you need to keep that person out of the lens. Certain lens designs, super tight fit lens designs, you need to keep them out a little bit longer. But we washed him out, and you can see that little pinguicula is a little yellow now, right? It doesn't look quite so irritated um, or, or annoyed. But go ahead and click again. Right. What you may not notice is on the other side of the eye, there's also an elevation. So he really has three nine pinguiculas. It's just that one is so prominent, we tend to zoom in and look at that. But he's got one at, at, at three o'clock, too, at that, on that nasal side. But what you didn't notice is he's got an elevation right at that superior limbus. It is very hard to see. Sometimes these elevations and these spots are are very difficult to notice on, on, on patient's eyes. We zoom in to what's the most obvious thing. Okay. You know, now I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know about this case, but what I had noticed on the previous slide when the uh, pinguecula was very angry and you had commented about the fact that the uh, lens looked a little small, it also looked like it was inferiorly decentered. And I would be mm -hmm. willing that that elevation on the top is pushing that lens down. Yeah, the whole thing has kind of moved its way down. Yeah. Down. Mm -hmm. These subtle things, they change the fit, right? Now, here's yes, what's really is. interesting. When we did uh, profilometry on this patient, it picked up those three and nine elevations, but it also picked up that superior elevation there as, as well, which you did not notice. I did not notice when I just looked at the patient. Okay. Now, what I uh, want to point out here is on this particular patient, and just for this particular lecture, I, I did uh, the, the elevation scan, but I also did an impression just so that we can compare. Now, in my world, I do a lot of validation, right? So I'm always validating uh, different modalities, different ways to make sure that um, software is, is behaving the same way. But I want you to notice on the impression here, he also, you can see that that superior elevation on, on, on that impression, and it got picked up on both of them, and you can see the, the pinguiculas there as well. What I would do want you to notice uh, down at the bottom, I put the major and the minor limbal shapes. What I want you to notice on this picture is that the, the um, they're, they're very similar but it is a very, the limbus is, is very oval or hyperbolic paraboloid in shape, right? And that's another reason that that lens was dropping, was when you put a round lens on something that's not round, it tends to kind of fall or anchor at those three and nine points and just kind of fall down off the eye. Sure. Go ahead and click again. Every point matters, right? And so when you have an eye like this, you can go in and say that pink, we know that that pinguicula tends to get mad. You can go in and actually elevate the data in that particular area. Maybe give it a little bit more clearance, a little bit more grace over something. We all know that pinguiculas kind of go up and down a little bit over, over time, uh, depending on how dry the eye is. So you may want to go in and just give it a little more grace, especially if it's an eye you know well. Sure. And you can see the very nice oval shape uh, delineated by your... Uh... Your, uh, by the blue, uh, by blue, the line, yeah. There. yeah, yeah. I, my blue oval, my yeah, your blue my limbal shape. Yep. And you can see if here's the design here. You can see how that pinguicula has a very subtle, but it goes up and over that eye, or that pinguicula there. Go ahead and click again. Right. So it's not for the most dramatic. You know, we see pictures on Facebook of all these super wavy, complicated eyes. Those, those, we know they're complicated, right? We know they're complicated. We go into them. Sure. It's an eye like this that you don't want to be complicated. You want this person to be a regular Joe Schmo. He comes in and you fit him and he leaves and you collect the money and you all move on in your life and everybody is, is happy with the relationship. Here, uh, you can see those data-driven designs and how, just how happy that eye looks after he, he's been wearing that contact lens. So, you know, you recognize problems before you fit, you can create these asymmetric designs, and then you can focally modulate the lens if you need to create more area. 
fantastic job there. And, and you just mm -hmm. hit on, on uh, something that I'm very uh, quick to point out. My menu is short. My, my agenda menu is short. I want the patient to come in. I want them in and out of my chair as fast <laughs> as possible and go tell the world I'm the best in the world. Send, send mm -hmm. your friends in. That's basically it. And uh, you really don't want to waste chair time. Uh, you're 100% correct on that. And I want to spend my chair time getting to know the person. I want to, I want to know who go. they are. I, I want to know what makes them tick. I well, don't need and, to spend the time thinking about plastic. Yeah. That's correct. And the more you know about them, the better job you can actually do addressing their specific needs. So, right. okay, this one, uh, this one looks like mine. So yeah. uh, here on the uh, Pentacam CSP uh, screen over here, what we could see on the uh, left-hand half of the screen are the cross-sectional arcs of this particular eye. Uh, and on the right-hand uh, side of the uh, screen, you get a whole bunch of data. Uh, you can see that the scleral angles are being given at a specific cord uh, along those uh, principal meridians, uh, along with also the sagittal depths over there. Uh, in the middle there, you can see that there's a, a graphic referring to how much coverage was grabbed during that uh, capture. Uh, and then you can use all those sort of unique sagittal depths to create a um, uh, a very patient-specific three-dimensional reference surface so that you can then design a lens around that. And that's basically the process. So if we take a look at the cross-sectional arcs over here, you can see that you get the overall shape along each meridian. On the left-hand side, you see the actual cross-section. Uh, you can see number six, it has a little square around it. That's the uh, uh, vertical meridian over there. And on the right-hand side where the arcs are, that's the one that's in red. So it's corresponding to that red uh, uh, cross-sectional arc, and that actually is the uh, vertical 90 to 70-degree meridian. Uh, you can see the extent of coverage. Uh, you can see on the lower right there, where I have a perfect circle, that's an elevation. Uh, and you can see how those arcs are going up and over the uh, that particular elevation on the cornea. And then also on the inferior portion of the cornea, where I have that vertical oval on the left-hand side of the arcs, that was dropout. I just wasn't able to capture any data there uh, due to the unusual shape of the eye. Now, on the uh, actual numbers that are given, uh, I just blew this up a little so you can see this over here. You can see the I selected a cord of 15.8 because I happen to be doing a lens of that diameter. And on the um, uh, red-blue cross sections that you see there, uh, those are the principal meridians at that particular diameter. And it's giving you those principal ones along with the angle, as well as the actual sagittal depth there. This is that coverage map I was talking about. And you could see on the upper left there, that yellow blue uh, picture down at the bottom, the inferior, that was that inferior portion I was having trouble uh, grabbing a hold of. Uh, and then of course, on the color map, that color coded map on the right there, you could see what the actual elevations are with uh, reference to those spheres. So here's a case. Uh, this fellow has a uh, keratoconus. Um, I'm not talking about the right eye here because on the right eye, I have I designed up a wave corneal uh, GP multifocal and he's at 20, 20 plus in that eye with J1 at near, so J1 minus at near. So he's doing very well on that eye, but the left eye's keratoconus is a little bit more advanced and we needed a scleral. And yes, you can mix and match lenses perfectly fine. He's, he's very comfortable in the corneal and the scleral. They, they're equally comfortable for him. Uh, but in this case, I designed a 15-8 uh, scleral lens. It's a freeform wave design, which is in the lower right-hand uh, part of the screen. I did make this a multifocal, and I took a look at the sagittal depth extremes there, and you could see the extremes that were measured uh, are about a one and a half millimeter difference. One and a half millimeters on an eye is very, very big. That's a, that's a lot of territory uh, to uh, cover with a lens. And if you take a look at the graphic on the upper half of the wave screen, you can see on the inferior portion of this lens, which is on the left-hand side, just how much deeper down that lens goes than it does on the superior portion on the right. With this scleral lens, he's at 20-25 minus and J1 minus at near, which is a phenomenal result on this keratoconic eye. Now, this is a uh, second case I was presenting today, and it's a very interesting case because uh, th this was a traveling patient. This patient uh, traveled into uh, Simi uh, from a fair number of miles away, uh, and uh, he's a 41-year-old uh, who was diagnosed with keratoconus, 
and he's wearing a pair of uh, uh, piggybacks on, on both eyes, a soft and a corneal GP on both eyes. And he's very comfortable with them, but the vision quality has been decreasing. He's been getting some scarring and striae, and uh, the ophthalmologist where he uh, lives had recommended being re refit to a scleral lens. They did that locally, and he was very, very uncomfortable. Uh, after a couple of hours of wear, the eyes became very inflamed, mm -hmm. and you could see the pictures down there. The right eye is on the left, and the left eye is on the right. Uh, that's what his eyes look like from wearing the scleral lens. Uh, he was told that he needed his pinguiculas removed, uh, so he went to another doctor to see about removing them, and that doctor said, no, they're not really that bad. Please just go get a better fitting lens, and that was when he had reached out and contacted me to travel and to see me. And so if we take a look here, you could see the arcs. Uh, the cross-sectional arcs there, giving you an idea of the uh, shape of his eyes, uh, the uh, right on the left side of the screen and the left eye on the right side of the screen. I captured data out to 18 millimeters. Uh, I designed the lens at uh, 15 and a half millimeters. Uh, you can see, again, the sagittal uh, extremes on this lens are pretty high. It's almost at a millimeter uh, on both lenses. And... Uh, I put the uh, parameters in over there and you could see the uh, refraction uh, that I had entered in. And these are the actual lens designs that I had designed uh, for him. And his outcome was he's now 20-20 in uh, each eye. He's got full day wear and he gets no redness whatsoever. So he was really taken care of very, very rapidly, uh, which was very helpful since I didn't have him uh, staying very long. He was actually only going to be in town for about 10 days for me. And so this was from a Monday through to a following Wednesday, at which time he left. So that's a very, very straightforward keratoconus mm -hmm. case. And yeah, he was all successful, one, two, three. Very, very simple. Uh, and yeah, he's doing absolutely fantastic. Now, the interesting thing was that since he had to make the trip, he decided to bring his mother with him. And he was, this, this is this patient, the 68-year-old, uh, who was just a traveling companion. And she was sitting in the room with him, and I looked over at her, and I saw she's wearing glasses. And I said, you have keratoconus too? And she said, oh, yes, I, I have keratoconus, and I had a lot of other things too. And so you can see her glasses that she came in wearing. Uh, the right eye is the better seeing eye at 2080 minus in the pair of glasses. She has no usable vision in the left eye uh, with those glasses. She had bilateral PKs uh, about 20 years uh, prior. Uh, she's also had bilateral cataract surgeries with um, implants, uh, and that was about seven years ago, seven and six years ago, respectively. Uh, but prior to the to the PK, she was actually doing pretty well, both with hard lenses and gas perms, for about 20 years. So she was really doing very, very nice, but once she had the uh, transplants, uh, not so much any longer. Uh, she had tried to get a lens on both eyes and failed miserably with all the corneal and scleral attempts. Uh, the left eyes had no usable vision uh, for the past 20 years, uh, and it's not correctable in glasses. And she did try to get some more sclerals more recently, and it was an awful experience for her. She was traumatized from the experience uh, because it was so painful. So if we take a look, mm -hmm. we could see exactly why they were having such a difficult time getting these fit. These are the cross-sectional um, shine fluke images that I captured on her. And you can see the right eye is a very, very uh, proud graft, but the left eye is beyond proud. That, that's a very, very deep chamber. You could see that the uh, left-hand side, uh, how thin the cornea is at the transition between the uh, uh, donor and host cornea. Uh, and that shape is very, very irregular. So. Here's the right eye and uh, the uh, corneal scleral capture I had done. I had done it with two captures at a 15 millimeter cord. She had very, very small apertures and I was gonna really try and get a very small lens on her. Uh, again, considering her age and she really has never had any um, a scleral lens history and she's really been traumatized. The last thing I wanted to do was traumatize her further. So. The left eye, however, you could see how much trouble I had get, getting data. Uh, there's missing data on the arcs on the left-hand side, and you could see on the upper right-hand side, there is no data whatsoever. Uh, that's my first problem. Right there on the coverage map, you could see just how much uh, difficulty I had capturing the data with the uh, Pentacam on this. 
So since I didn't have any data like that, what I did is I resorted to a little bit of resourcefulness from other screens on the Pentacam so I can get some sense of what's going on. I knew I was gonna fit about a 15 millimeter lens. So I went ahead on the left-hand side there, you could see the CSP of this patient through the one cross section. And I compared that to a normal eye on the right. And you could see the difference in elevation uh, on that left-hand side by that drop. Uh, that drop is uh, considerable compared to what the normal uh, drop was on the normal eye. So I went ahead and measured it because that's one of the things you can do uh, just by left clicking on that screen. And you can see there that the sag on the left hand side there is a little over 6,000, uh, where on the normal eye it's about 4274. Uh, we're talking about almost two millimeter drop. And so that, that, that's a very, very depressed eye, uh, depressed portion of the eye over there um, at the 15 millimeter cord. So obviously that's my second uh, problem. First one is I'm missing data. And the second one is we're dealing with a two millimeter difference in elevation uh, at the sagittal extremes. Uh, I also had the retro illumination and you could see the, the normal eye on the right, which is nice and bright. And on the left, you could see how dark it is. And that was from the scarring on her cornea. She didn't have any, any cataract any longer. This was purely corneal. And so this is the third problem. We now have a very, very scarred cornea. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the, the details of densitometry they can do on the pentagon here, but what you can see is basically on a normal cornea, that lower left-hand screen is dark. And the darker it is, the better it is, because that means all the light is getting through. Uh, on her eye, all those white spots there are basically reflectivity. And the whiter it is, the worse it is. And now we can see why on the retro illumination, uh, it was so incredibly dark. This was right at the very, very surface. And then I dropped that down a little bit further into the cornea and you can see just how uh, reflective the entire cornea is over there. So this was definitely gonna be another problem dealing with this uh, left eye. Uh, just for the purpose of this lecture, I put this together here. You could see the top is the actual shine fluid image I captured. And on the bottom, what I did was I just rotated that 180 degrees around so you can see just how different the nasal and temporal elevations were gonna be on this particular eye. That really is probably close to a two millimeter difference. So I went ahead and I used this shine fluid image to actually try and measure that. And you could see what I got here is I got about 4395 to about 5,000. So this was saying it was maybe about a millimeter. So this is not the best way to measure, but at least gave me some sense of where, uh, where, where the actual surface of the eye was going to be. Um, once again, on the left-hand side, you can see just how thin the uh, junction is between the uh, host and uh, donor cornea. These were the actual color maps. We have a lot of extrapolated uh, data there. Uh, but even so, you can still see that, I, I circled that box at the bottom, that inferior portion, it really is um, incredibly depressed uh, from the uh, reference sphere. And so I went ahead and designed up a lens. Uh, we're not gonna talk about the right lens because the right lens was actually very straightforward uh, for me, but this left lens was very, very interesting to try and get a lens designed on there. And this was, these were the parameters I had on that first lens. And I went ahead and put that lens on her and we got on the right eye, first lens, 2050 minus left eye, 2400. But look at where the acuities are with the over refraction. We had some real good potential for vision there, 2025 20, plus on the right and 2030 minus on the left. Very nice for an eye that hasn't seen for 20 years. Uh, looking at the actual fit, you can see even despite all of that missing data, I did actually pretty well on both eyes. I had a little bit of inadequate limbal clearance on the left eye. The center was a little bit higher than I wanted, uh, but it wasn't really terrible. And she was leaving later that day, but now she was very excited. And she told me she was gonna come back uh, about a month and a half later. So what I did was I went ahead and ordered a pair of lenses for her uh, to uh, uh, be there for her for her arrival when she came back. So she came back uh, about a month and a half later. And this was the second lens that I had put on her. Uh, and on the back uh, surface of Wave, you get all of these uh, color maps so you can actually appreciate what the changes are because they're very hard to see from that screen. But what you can see is on the 
projected fluorescein map. I did increase the limbal clearance and the edge clearance on both. And you could see I also waited in the minus four uh, over a fraction into that second lens. So how did we do? Well, the right eye was 2040 plus, the left eye was 2050 plus, and for some reason, she still had some over a fraction data. But look at where we are now, 2020 on the right eye and 2025 minus on the left eye with a little bit of over a fraction. You can see now that the fit is quite nice. Both lenses are actually fitting pretty nicely over, over those uh, very, very tough eyes. So here in just uh, uh, two empirically fit lenses, we already have a very good fitting lens. I trained her up and I had her come back five days later so we could see how things were going. In the meantime, I ordered up a third lens to deal with that over refraction because again, we were on a time crunch. So you can see I made no changes on the nasal, temporal side, superior, inferior. I kept all that the same. Basically, all I did for the left eye is put in the plus 175 over refraction. Uh, when she came in, I wanted to assess how that second pair did. Uh, she was doing very well. The vision was good. She was very comfortable. So you're still having trouble getting them on and off. And they were on for three hours that day. She was about 20, 30, and 20, 50, respectively. Uh, the right eye was fitting absolutely perfect. The left eye, it was really good, but I noticed there was some inferior conjunctival prolapse over there. So I probably was a little too gracious on the limbal clearance uh, inferiorly. Uh, Remove they, removed the lenses, and they came off very easily. She had no staining on the cornea whatsoever. Uh, when I had put the third pair on, right eye is at 20, 20 now. Left eye was at 20-30, and strangely enough, she took another plus one, which got her to 20-25. She was leave her, leaving later that day, and so I let her leave with that pair. Uh, yeah, there was still a little inferior conjunctival prolapse because it was already there from the previous ones I had just taken off. And what I had told her was that since she was leaving, I'm designing another pair for her for when she comes back. Uh, I gave her an RX for some reading glasses to wear over it, and I told her to follow up the local doctor if she had any problems. Um, I did get a follow-up. She didn't, she didn't get to make it back, and she's actually coming back in another few months, uh, but um, she's done absolutely fantastic with the lenses over the course of the year. So that's a really wonderful case, and I, there's no possible way you could have done anything like that that quickly or as efficiently uh, with any type of diagnostic fitting. <laughs> Um, that is a great case, Ken. Oh my gosh, you really couldn't have done that without knowing in some type of data to be able to to Correct. move that that forward. You know, I I I, I find it interesting. I think um, to be honest, I might I might have stopped at lens number two um, with the over refraction, and and I'll, I'll tell you why. This is uh, this is not rehearsed, right? I'll tell no, you why not. I would have. I would have stopped at lens number two, is because you had plus O in your over refraction, you were actually creating a telescope on her. And oh, so know. sometimes in these cases, um, uh, having that little bit of a plus in glasses on top of it is, is an advantage. And sometimes you get better vision with that plus in the glasses because you are actually literally creating a telescope system for that patient's eye, and especially if they need a bifocal anyway. Sometimes I just go ahead and I give them the plus in the glasses with the bifocal uh, because they'll actually see a little bit better with that extra little bit of, now if they're plus five, I wouldn't, but a plus one, right. plus two, I, I, I might leave her at, at that. Um, well, I can tell you my... Just, my, my my plan when she comes back is I'll get a multifocal on there as well. So it's just a matter. It's just, <laughs> it's, just, it's just we had to get the distance taken care of first. <laughs> mm, I know where I'm sending all my patients now, Ken. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, and I like that is really complex. And that might be where I jump to impression technology for my personal patients. Um, just because you get those really subtle complexities and you don't have sure. to, my brain, I, I don't have to jump through the math that you did, but um, I spend a lot of time trying not to think, actually. Um, so go ahead and click click one more. Um, All right. All right. So, let's so, up here. so with impression okay. technology, you get a lot of data. So all the areas where you can't get that missing data, uh, you really do get that data when you do impression technology. And so you get that data in straight ahead gaze, you know, under the upper and the lower eyelid. Uh, and so you get, there's some really complex changes that that, that patients have out in the far periphery. Um, I've actually, it's, it's so subtle. I actually had a patient where I took the impression out and I'm like, what is in there? And uh, when I, uh, 
actually had the patient look way down and I flipped the lid way up there. The patient actually had an ocular tumor that came out in the, or that showed up in the impression. And that's how we actually diagnosed it was uh, looking at what the elevation differences that were coming out in, in that, in that impression. So with, we call this elevation specific technology and every single point matters. And I'm going to tell you how, kind of how this kind of software works, but and when you create 3D, so you're in the 3D space and you create these STL files, really everything is this mesh. We call it this mesh work. And it's these tiny, itty bitty triangles, right? So rather than thinking of curves and raising and lowering things, you, you have these little intersected triangles. And basically think about it like grabbing one of those intersections where the triangle comes together and you can pull it up or pull it down and it creates sort of this i think it kind of looks like chain mail right but on the on the surface of the ocular surface it will look like that as well so you can get these if you have an undulating eye you get these complex curvature changes that go across that eye so we say every single point matters and the the size of these triangles will uh, depend on uh the complexity that you can cut. So the smaller the triangles, the more complexity that you can cut into that lens, but then the greater the lathe, lathing time. So when you start creating lenses that aren't round and really weird things on the eye, it takes a lot longer to cut those lenses. Um, but you can get that focal changes. And what, however, though, once you really have a lens that fits very securely onto the eye and doesn't move um, with blinks and things like that, you can start putting these advanced optics on. So, you know, I've been playing with just very high resolution, uh, higher order optics on these lenses. So we now can take like your patients, we can we can drill down through all of these these crazy, you know, optical situations. And, and really, like you said, you could not just put multifocals, but we can do HOA corrected multifocals and and um, lots of things on, on these, these patients eyes. Great. So with the iPrint Pro product, this is an impression based uh, uh, product and we do things. We can do prism in any direction, the multifocal optics. We can decenter the optics on it. So we can decenter the front and the back optics, right? The back of the lens is for uh, fit and the front of the lens is for optics. So we can move those optics independently of each other, uh, the higher order uh, higher order optics. We can do elevation specific transition zones. So not quad specific, right? But with on the cornea itself, we can come in and we can go over pterygia, for example, that are growing onto the cornea and create that elevation specific design on the cornea itself. Um, and we can, of course, putting in fenestrations, I think that's something that we need to talk more about as we get into some of these really sick very, very complicated eyes, uh, adding them in for protection. Here's an example. Of, of impression technology in creating these not round lenses. But what I want to point out to you here is it also can be done bedside. So the patient doesn't have to come to you. You can come to the patient, right? You can, I, I go bedside. Uh, it, I, I frequently will go into the PICU. I can go to nursing homes. Um, a patient can't ambulate out of the chair. They can't get to, to my high-tech equipment. Uh, we can take an impression anywhere, anytime. Uh, as you know, Ken, I have taken many impressions in exhibit halls, hotel rooms, hallways, restaurants, you know, parties, bars, wherever you want them. Um, but here's a little one. I, t I did his first impression at five days old, and uh, he is three, oh, maybe almost four. I don't know. He's an amazing, amazing uh, ad addition to my life, I suppose. Um, and we've done this not round lens, and we've actually saved his eye. And they've actually chosen not to close the coloboma uh, at this point and do lid surgery, uh, because he's just doing so well in the in the contact lens uh, that they're just waiting for the eye to grow and, and wait for the, the appropriate tissue then to, to come in and close that eyelid coloboma. Uh, yeah. You know that you can only do surgery so many times, right? Yeah, it's a fantastic um, application there yeah. uh, to be able yeah. to protect the eye like that. Yeah, uh, go ahead. And you create, we notch around that, that where it's, where the lid is actually stuck to the, um, the globe there. You know, you can actually create the lens that goes around that area there. Here's an example of what I call crazy lumpy eyes. And there's a lot of crazy lumpy eyes out there. And this particular patient uh, has a, a corneal neurotonization, right? So they took a, a nerve from her leg and then brought it up and put it onto her eye. But the problem is, is she's neurotrophic. She can't shut her eyes. Uh, so she has extreme 
exposure. She kept getting infections. Her cornea was breaking down. It, it, it was a terrible situation uh, for her. And so by taking this impression, you can really see those nerves coming around the cornea there. They were, they were very, very high. I mean, we are talking almost two millimeters in elevation here. Um, but we created a lens. And you can see the lens on the right-hand side there. It just literally goes up and over all of those nerves. And this was done in one lens. Right. One lens. It didn't require any modification to this eye at all. And she's been wearing these lenses now um, uh, for for several for a couple of years, actually. And uh, her scar and her cornea has re regressed. Um, we actually ended up doing another impression after about maybe six to nine months of lens wear because everything calmed down so much. You can see how angry her eye was when we first started. Everything just calmed down to the point where um, her elevation changed and we had to do a, a new lens because she improved so dramatically. You can see that's an example of a non-round lens. Yeah. Are you concerned about that pigmentation on the uh, lower lid there? Is yeah, that that's what I mean. No, that's actually, that's actually caused by surgery. Well, that was surgeries. a surgical thing. Got That's it. a okay. surgical pigmentation, yeah, but we are watching it. Of course, <laughs> she's followed very closely with my team, uh, my cornea team, my acrylic plastics team. We're, we're all a big team at my hospital. Sure. <laughs> yep. Okay. Right. Here's an example of some serious diseases. And, you know, we all see these patients that are, um, this patient has rheumatoid arthritis and um, a corneal melt. And you can see in the second photo there where uh, if you've got a lens on somebody's eye and you see that or you see their pupil peaked, do not take their lens off of their eye because it's probably tamponading and holding the contents of their eye in. Um, we ended up, I saw this patient, we ended up taking him back to surgery. He got this big scleral graft. I did the impression right over what you're seeing there. And then I dispensed the lens. And so that is after dispensing the lens. And he's now had this lens for about a year um, and has maintained his eyeball in his head. We are all very happy with that. Um, but other examples, you know, Stevens Johnson syndrome, um, you know, uh, uh, graft versus host disease, uh, uh, lichen planus, you know, these are very uh, rare things and, and you really want to be able to manage these patients and you either need to send them to somebody who manages them or if you have the right technology, you have the data-driven design technologies in your practice, you can manage these with, with uh, or co-manage them with their other doctors, their rheumatologists and their, their other doctors as well. Um, but you don't, in some of these eyes like this, you do not have the luxury of tinkering with the design. Like, you have to get this design right because if you get rubbing on these eyes, you, they, they could lose the eye, literally lose yeah. the eye, right? That's, and so absolutely. that's where these data-driven designs are at such a high level that you can feel confident in dispensing the lens and knowing it's not gonna rub any key area uh, on the eye. Right. Here's an example of uh, a patient. Again, this is a patient with uh, rheumatoid arthritis who has a persistent epithelial defect that had been there at this point for well over six months, and the eye was just breaking down. They could not keep it epithelialized, and uh, you know, even with the advent of, of Oxervate, a lot of these eyes, they'll, they they um, will regenerate, but then they'll, they'll, they'll just drop right off and become neurotrophic again. And, and so with this particular patient, I can take the impressions are so safe on the eye that we took the impression right over this epithelial defect. We dispensed the lens. By the end of the week, that epithelial defect had actually healed in. And you can see even a year later, that eye is white and quiet and, and, and happy just from that protection. You know, oh, Impressive. Impressive. Very nice. Mm -hmm. You know, these patients have a lot going on in their lives. The plastic needs yes. to be the least of, of thing that you're dealing with, you know. Yes, you're right. So when you, yeah. So the other thing with, with data-driven designs is when you're dealing with plastic that's in the eye and you have a plastic squishy tissue plastic sandwich, the squishy tissue often does not win, right? So when you drop a contact lens on these eyes, a tube comes in and it arcs, right? And so there's a high point to that tube. And often that high point is gonna be really close to the edge of that lens. And that's where your rub point is gonna be. And you can erode that tube. Tube erosions are bad. They're also very dangerous, right? Because that person could get endophthalmitis. You could lose the eye for that patient. This is a very bad consequence of fitting fitting eyes with hardware. Um, even, an, even a scleral sutured or a, a, a scleral suture IOL will have knots buried right under that sclera. And if you don't know where they are, you will have a plastic squishy tissue plastic sandwich and you will erode the knot out of the patient's eye, sending them back to surgery. Um, so with data-driven designs, 
um, you know, especially specifically, you know, impression based designs, you know exactly where that dot or that knot is and you will have a bump in the lens that's right over that knot. So you will not squish that down. Right? And so what we do in the software is when there is a tube, we actually can increase focally the, the elevation. We add about 400 microns automatically right over a tube. And by adding that 400 microns, what happens is the conjunctiva is going to migrate in underneath that, and the conjunctiva is going to thicken. But you will have plastic conjunctiva, but no pressure on the plastic that's below it. So you don't end up with a compression of plastic squishy tissue plastic, and you'll be confident in, in avoiding those erosions over the tube. Again, you don't have the uh, it, it, you don't have the pleasure of time of putting a lens on and go, ooh, ooh it eroded, mm -hmm. my bad. Right? You can't make those, right. those things happen. <laughs> you have to feel confident. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I, I, I like this one here. This, this this is targeted conjunctival prolapse to fix the problem. I like that. It, it really is. It really is. And you can watch it. You can watch it migrate. It's not prolapsing onto the cornea. It's, it's no, kind of picketing off. Right yeah. over the tube. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I... And, and, and well, actually, I can actually teach a whole separate lecture, but I can teach people how to measure it and watch it over time um, to make sure that you're not getting thinning of any of the tissue in those areas. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. And I've had people wearing these designs now for, for 10 years, right? So I've watched a lot of these tubes over time, but I've made mistakes. I know, I know what to avoid. Okay, so why data-driven designs? Basically, it comes down to go ahead and just keep clicking. It comes down to you're fitting the actual ocular shape and not guessing, right? So it's going to speed up. It's going to uh, create the experience that patients are looking for. You know, when you think about the refractive surgery world, um, patients expect to see right away, or they expect to have that experience of, of good vision right away. When you go into cataract surgeries, patients expect to have these incredible outcomes right out of surgery, right? And the same thing is happening with contact lenses now at this point as well. Our patients, no matter how complex they are, even those crazy eyes that we were looking at before, they people expect it to just work. They expect you to know how to manipulate the plastic. What they really want you to spend your time on is getting to know who they are. And they want to know that you know that golfing is really important, right? Or they want you to know that they're going to be doing a lot of time on the computer and that that vision is really important. That That's what I think patients want. Sure, you know, absolutely. Go ahead and click one more. You know, they come in and just like my menu is short, their menu is short. They came in, mm -hmm. fixed me. They're not, they're not concerned with all the hurdles you have to jump through. All they want is just fix me so I can go back right. and live my life, whether it's playing golf or, or the case may be. And, you know, right. why, why data-driven designs? Because we're really creating plastic to fit the eye rather than the other way around. You know, when you're doing diagnostic fitting, you're basically taking an eye and trying, fitting, mm -hmm. trying to fit it into some plastic that's already pre-designed. And this is just a much, much better process. You, you, yeah. You, uh, I tell patients it's like a couture suit, right? That's exactly <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. But, you know, it, like you said, you were able to get those patients in and out of your practice, right? Because Absolutely. you had that data, right? So I think, our, I think our colleagues really need to think about how much time, how much time are people spending, not just in their chair time, but in the callbacks, right? How what is it worth to you to put a lens on the patient and have the first lens go, oh my gosh, doctor, this feels great, I can see, as opposed to going, mm, well, we're gonna try again, and right? Because and you do that so many times, it breaks their confidence, you know. That, that that's correct. You 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 kind of lose the 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 trust bond that you would normally be able to form when you just get a lens on and said, wow. This is really good. And again, you take the lady who traveled in with the son uh, that came to see me. I mean, she was she was traumatized. She didn't. When, when I said to her, let mm -hmm. me put you into a lens. You're here. She said, well, I don't think so. Uh, you know, and I said, no, no, no. Let's. And, and what she did was that's the reason why we ran out of time with her. She waited to see how her son did first before she mm -hmm. said, oh, yeah, he did pretty well. Maybe he can help me out. 
And then, and then, mm-hmm. you know, I got the first pair of lenses on her and not only wasn't she traumatized, she actually had good vision. And she said, wow, these are really comfortable. This, this isn't like what I had before. So that, that earns that trust rather than breaking mm-hmm. the trust that, you, that you're trying to get. You're absolutely right. right. Yeah. And the patients look at you and they say, is this going to work? Is this going to work? Is this going to be okay? And I find with these data-driven designs, I can say, yes, you're going to be fine. You're going to be absolutely fine. You know, yep. it, it's, it's all going to work. All right. And I think that clicks one more time. I think that really yeah. brings us back to our last point is data-driven designs take the focus off the plastic and put it on the patient. Right? It's, it's paying attention. These data-driven designs, they pay attention to details. So you don't have to pay attention to those details as much. You can pay attention to the patient. That sums it up very nicely. Uh, Great no job, problem. guys. So, hey, I, All right. I, I know we, we're running a little bit long, but I've got a, an important question for both of you. Um, I made a transition myself to data-driven di- uh, designs about three years ago. And I made the mistake of thinking that these data-driven designs were only for the train wrecks, the ones that I mm. failed mm. on. And so, and I made that mistake for about two years, thinking that I'm just going to save this for the ones that are failing in my traditional uh, lens designs. Um, since then, I've come across multiple practitioners that I've learned from, and some of which are doing 100% data-driven designs, even on a dry eye patient or a normal cornea and things like that. So you, do you want to comment, and I love seeing these complicated cases, but can you comment a little bit on the uh, quote-unquote normal corneas that you fit with scleral lenses and the fact that you still use data-driven designs for those eyes? Yeah, I, I do 100% data-driven design, and mostly it's because you're going to spend the money one way or the other, right? You're going to spend the money in your chair time, patient time, patient time out of work, something. The money's going to be spent one way or the other. Data-driven designs really aren't more expensive than, than diagnostic fitting um, because you're saving money in your chair and, and patient happiness and, and everything. And, and so I have switched over. Uh, mostly because I'm happier, my patients are happier, my staff is happier. Um, they're not fielding the phone calls. We're not doing the back end work. We're not doing the returns. Um, it, it's just so it's so much faster. Uh, everybody, everybody from beginning to end is happier. And and, and uh, I myself, uh, Bill, in answer to your question, you know, I started back in uh, 2000 uh, with this, and interestingly enough kind of like you at the beginning, I kind of said, well, yeah, the more complicated one I'll use this for, and then the normal stuff, I'll just continue fitting normal lenses. And, and again, I'm not just talking about sclerals, but even corneal GP lenses at that time. And mm-hmm. what I came to realize very rapidly, why am I fitting an inferior product for the normal eyes? Mm-hmm. It's, it's not even close to performing nearly as well as I can do from this these data-driven designs. And so it took me probably all of about three or four months and I just abandoned all of the diagnostic fitting and just dove right into the, all the empirical fitting to get to get good data, design up a lens, get the patient successful, and ultimately successful in a better lens. It's, mm-hmm. it's not just that it was faster, they've actually got a better product at the end point as well. So yes, I, I, would, I would agree with uh, you know, the path that you traveled, Bill, uh, because mm-hmm. it's the exact same thing that I did at the beginning as well. Yeah. yeah, you know, it, it, it was an expensive oh. lesson. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you have to think about what type of practice you want to build and who do you want to attract to come to your practice, right? And and people don't come to me because they want meh. Right? Mm-hmm. They, they, <laughs> right. they 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 want it to work and they want to move on with their life and I they want me to be the least important person in their world. <laughs> well, well, I don't know the answer to this, but I'm pretty sure it's the same one that I get all the time. How many times, Chris, has the patient looked you in the eye and said, you're my last hope? Because they've, they, they've already gone through so many lens yeah. designs that didn't work, and they're relying on you to now get them successful. Yeah, it, and whether they say it out loud <laughs> or whether I feel it. So sometimes you feel it. You know, sometimes there's this there's this underlying thing that patients bring to our package or pa- practices, and it's it's hope, 
but it's also despair. And right. we have the ability to make our patients crazy. Um, we have the ability to dash their dreams. And it is my responsibility, I feel, it is my responsibility, and I feel this very deeply, to always be offering them and to know what's out there and how I can make their experience better. 100% agree. That's, a, that's mm -hmm. the exact same way I think about it as well. One more clinical observation I want to get you both to comment on, and, and Chris, you kind of touched on it briefly in the beginning of the talk. Uh, one of the first things I noticed as I entered into the data-driven world is um, my fits were so much better that things like midday fogging almost came off my plate, and I didn't have to deal with that mm -hmm. anymore. But the new thing that came on my plate, and it wasn't it wasn't common, but it did happen occasionally, was it fits so darn good that now fenestrations were necessary. So can you just comment a little bit about if you do fenestrations, where do you place them, um, especially in a, in a highly irregular cornea, and, um, and how often do you do that? And, and Phil, question Phil I have so many questions about what your fits looked like before you did data-driven <laughs> designs. <laughs> but anyway. My favorite <laughs> fits. <laughs> so, but anyways, with um, I don't find that fenestrations are necessary all the time. So with the, the mm -hmm. way I design lenses and the way I do them, it's a tangential landing 360 degrees. So the lenses aren't tight. They don't transfer tears, but they're not tight. So like when you take them off, there's no, like if you take a lens off the eye and it's going when you take it off, either you're taking it off completely wrong or that lens is way too tight. But I do am using more and more fenestrations for my graft patients. And I'm always beginning mm -hmm. to wonder if we just should fenestrate our graft patients. And I put them in the mid, I'm a fit big person. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's really necessary if you're, if you're fitting a lot smaller, but I'm a, I'm a fit big person because I fit all these crazy eyes. But I put them at 10 and two to start. And what I find is about a two millimeter, two to three millimeter fenestration at 10 and two, will release a lot of the negative pressure that we get underneath these lenses. And I'm not 100% sure this is all an oxygen thing. I think on these graphs, suction compromises endothelial function. And when we release it so there's no suction during wear, um, I can keep, I have patients that have been wearing fenestrations for five or six years without any edema, whereas prior to that, they'd had edema. And, and so I think fenestrations are, are quite helpful for that. What, what, what about you, Ken? I agree with you that, uh, number one, I don't think it's about oxygen. Uh, I think mm -hmm. the uh, suction forces, yeah, one of the things that uh, newer scleral lens fitters always sort of kind of wrap onto is, oh, well, it's vaulting the cornea, so it doesn't do anything to the cornea. Uh-uh. There's, there's plenty mm -hmm. of forces that are underneath these lenses that have impact on the cornea. And I, I agree 100% with you that um, oxygen is certainly one of the things, but I do think that you have, um, you know, the suction forces as well as compressive forces. Again, don't forget that a sealed lens has a sealed system underneath it. And as the lens settles throughout the day, liquid is not compressible. And so it is going to compress all of that into the cornea. So you you are having an impact on the cornea. It may not be like a, like a corneal GP with plastic on a cornea, but you still have an interaction between the lens and the uh, surface of the eye. Um, mm -hmm. I I personally I I I fenestrate just a very very few. Uh, it tends also to be kind of centered around graft patients. I agree, I agree mm -hmm. with you on that as well. Uh, on the other ones, I think that when you get these data-driven designs, uh, unlike um, uh, Bill, who seems to be getting them to suck on really, really good, um, <laughs> you have this sort of tangential landing over a fairly right? large area, it, it really does come off very easily. It, it, mm -hmm. it really does. You, you don't have that sort of like that pop sound like you're talking about. And so I agree, probably getting the flange of the lens to be much more tangential evenly all the way around, which is impossible it, with, with any diagnostic fitting. You, you just can't do that because it's just too irregular. But with these types of designs and you get these sort of freeform uh, flowing flanges, I think you really get a much, much more even bearing over the entire surface. And that avoids a lot mm -hmm. of that problem. 
Yeah, I so think I with the data-driven designs, the suction is less of a problem. I think the um, uh, that in the limbal hyperemia is uh, is less of a problem, and midday fogging is less of a problem. Almost to the point when you see it, it will feel unusual to you. Like you'll be like, oh, oh, gosh, what's going on here? As opposed to the regular seeing it very regularly that you do with with. Right, I, I agree. Those, those, those are the unusual. Those are the unusual. It's unusual type of things there. They're not regular at all. So I said that was the last question. I have one more question that came in. It's a really good question. Um, and it's how do you deal with the irregular cornea optics? Do you, uh, uh, when you order your first lens, if you don't, if you don't have a, a trial lens and a base curve and a power to start with, do you deal with your fit first lens as a fit lens and then do an over fraction? And this is for both Ken and Chris. Um, or do you do uh, some kind of optical calculation, even though you don't have a spectacle RX because the cornea is so irregular? How do you how do you deal with the optics? Is it is it a two step process, or is there some trick that you guys do without putting any lens on the eye to to do this calculation? I'll go first. So, yeah, go. <laughs> so 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 when I started fitting uh, from the scleroperiferometry uh, back in eighteen. And uh, all of a sudden, these first fits were really good. I mean, wow. It's, it's like I was amazed how much, like I was 95 to 100% there on the first lens fit. I briefly had this brush with, maybe I should get those diagnostic lenses out so I can get some power readings, and then I can get more accurate power readings. And what it turned down to is, I, what it turned into is I, I said, well, I don't really want to waste the patient's time. I don't want to waste chair time on that. You know what? I'll just continue to do what I'm doing, assuming that if I just have to make a power change, I'll order a second lens. And if I don't have to make a power change, great. We're fantastic. So as far as tricks uh, up front without doing a diagnostic fitting with a base curve and a trial lens power and all of that, what I will do is everything at my disposal. So if they came in with a lens, I'll, you know, a, a GPL, I'll, I'll measure base curve, powers on that lens, and I will just put that to one side. I'll try and refract them. How close is that to what the parameters were on that GP lens that I, that I just took off there, you know, from, from, from that they come in with? Um, one of the nice things is I get on the uh, Pentacam aberrometry some more refractive data. So I might take all of these things and try and come up with some best guess as to what the optics are supposed to be for that first lens with the idea that, you know, I'm probably still going to tweak something. Even if it's a minor edge thing or something like that, I'm still going to tweak that and I'll just take care of the power at that time once I have a good fitting lens. Because one of the things that I found, I don't know if you found this, Chris, but one of the things that I found is that you, you remember like historically that you have an irregular cornea, so puts put any any GP on there so you can get some potential for vision. Well, what I found is that's actually the least amount of potential for vision you get because if the lens doesn't fit well, even if it stays on long enough for you to do an over refraction, it generally is still wrong because once you actually get the lens to fit properly, it's no longer tilting. It's really that was sitting. The yeah. You're right. It's sitting that was, properly. That was, that's exactly the point I was going to make. That was exactly right. the point. So even if you get over refractive data, you're almost always going to have a second lens for power because when you get the when you get a lens, a data driven lens isn't going to go, you know, and yeah. and and now now you're looking through the optical center and you're not getting tilt and you're not getting drop and you don't get that weird coma then uh, da, 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 like all this stuff, right? Absolutely. And, and you often will get a different power. So. I try to get in the ballpark. I may throw a lens on to just get a quick refraction. Um, and by me, I mean my staff um, to get us into the right ballpark. Um, but I I don't say this is going to be your end all be all power, right? Because you really can nail down. And with data driven designs, putting Torix on the front surface is not an issue. It is not hard to do. No. And you're not trying to like weirdly do oblique cross cylinder stuff. Like you don't have to do any of that. Like it is right. It, you just tell them what the power is and it literally just gets put on the lens. And and because these lenses sit so so securely. So yeah, I mean you want to get in a close range, but I mean you yeah. know if somebody's a high myope or a hyperope or something like that. That, that that's exactly it. I I'll, I'll, I'll try and get in the ballpark, but you know, if you put a trial lens on and like you said, it, it's tilting or it's decentering or whatever, that's not going to be an accurate refraction anyway. 
And so I'm probably gonna still have to fine tune it, which is why I really didn't break mm -hmm. out the diagnostics. I'll just take my best guess for that first lens and, and move on uh, You know, mm -hmm. uh, with getting the lens on. So I have a good fitting lens and now it's trustworthy that I can get an over fraction that's proper. Yeah, so I have a set of just Plano lenses that I, there are a whole bunch of them, right? So th that my staff will, um, after we grab, I go in and I talk to the patient, right? Who are you? Why are you here? What are you going to expect? What is your care map? What is your road map? How many visits are we going to expect here? Does this, is this all going to work into your life, right? Once we've established we're going to do this, I then, uh, uh, I leave. I have a staff that comes in, takes the impressions, goes, puts my Plano trial lens on, does an over refraction. The patient comes out, we all hug and they move on and I see them back for the follow up and we I go through the same thing with them again. You know, how are you doing? What's going on in your life? Right. And I drill in on that's when I drill in on that refraction at that point. See, I don't I don't have that to delegate sense. that too. Life dreams, hopes and dreams. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris and Ken, I can't thank you guys enough for sharing your expertise with all of us. As always, you always learn so much from these presentations. Um, thank you so much for spending the time tonight, and I look forward to the next time we do one of these again. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye now.